I'm Walter Block. I'm Jody Emery. This is Adam Kokesh. I'm Jeffrey Tucker. I'm Ben Swan. I'm Tom Woods. I'm Peter Schiff. I'm Eric Voorhees. And you're listening to... And you're listening... And you're listening... You're listening... You're listening to... Ed and Ethan. Soak up the awesomeness. nightmare i have a three-line phone and nothing at all to do with my time <laughs> dale gribble making an appearance on the ah, show finally yes. we Good haven't time. done clips in the beginning of the show for no, a while no it's been yeah. a while we've kind of been missing out on the clips but, yeah we uh, have but there you go a little treat you are listening to ed and ethan the voice of liberty in canada coming to you from saskatoon the province of saskatchewan and the cold and frozen wastes of kanakistan my incredible intrepid co-host ed joins me as he often does welcome ed Thank Say you, hello Ethan. Uh, hello, world. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible talents displayed, as always. Uh, I'm, of course, your humble host, Ethan. You're listening to us on dailypaulradio.com, as well as uh, Liberty Radio Network, LMR, VVN, all that good stuff. The corners of the web that we are in. Um, and before we start the grand, glorious, and amazing show... Uh, I guess, I don't know, how should we preface this? Yes, I don't know. we have an announcement uh, Yeah, to for yeah. those who aren't tuned into our FaceTubes page and all that. Um, yeah, we're, we're shutting down. The show is coming to an end in the short term. We're winding things down. Ed and Ethan is going off the air. Uh, one more episode after this, and we will be done. So, yeah. That's just how it's happening. One more after this? This isn't the last one? We're doing one more? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought this it was the last one. It would be a one. good thing if you kept yeah. on top of the schedule. <laughs> See, this is why we're quitting. Ed just doesn't know what's yeah. going on. No, I'm, I, the, we've been doing this for, what, a little over two years now? Yes, and it has it's, been. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's been really great. But we just don't have the time to commit to it. It's been getting tougher and tougher, especially with you with a one-year-old now. Yes, it, um, it is. It is. That makes uh, your priorities kind of switch. You know, uh, when uh, Nima Vidotti there with the Freedom Fiends, uh, when he came out with his announcement that he's quitting, I was kind of like, whoa. <laughs> and, you know, he yeah. he was he was in it uh, with the, the new baby there for a short period of time, and he had to call her quits. And, yeah. and you know, that kind of got me thinking, too. And, uh, yeah, I just... You just gotta spend uh, that time with the with the with the young ones. You know, maybe when they're a little bit older, when they're a little mm-hmm. bit more independent, then uh, you can kind of pursue your passions. But uh, right now, it's uh, I need to focus in on that just because I want to cr- get him to have, you know, the most. Uh, the best experience he can get, and I want to instill uh, as much as of uh, of um, freedom and awesomeness of of, right. of being able to be what he wants to do, and he needs that supervision, and and I need to be there for yeah. him. So. Well, what this boils down to is rather than enrich my life, you'd rather enrich your baby's life, Lysander. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I'm gonna have to kind of swallow that and yep. deal with it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> You know, I play second fiddle again. Oh, well, whatever. And, and you yourself, too, Ethan. You know, it's <laughs> it, you, we, you want to pursue other things, too. And, That's true. Uh, we, we've we've tried this, and and uh, it's time to, to tone it down a little. Well, um, you, know, you it, know, it's been very enjoyable. But, yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've been really having trouble with time management as well. And that's okay. That's okay, because what we're going to do in the meantime is we'll, we'll not be going away. No. Uh, you can still visit edandethan.com. We'll put some stuff up there from time to time. We're going to... Well, our YouTube channel... By the way, our YouTube channel is like, what, near a 1,000 subscribers? I think so, yeah. So that's kind of cool. That's awesome. Um, and we're going to see if we can do some video yeah. kind of stuff. We're you moving know, from little... the audio to the video, so I don't know if, well, sort if of. we're going to break some uh, lenses. <laughs> or <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, we're, we're also going to be doing some other stuff. It's not like a podcast show kind of thing. We're going to be looking at uh, some kind of like uh, man on the street things and yeah, interview interviewing people. people and getting people uh, to, you know, uh, think and uh, maybe show it to the world uh, yeah. of... Of the Saskatonians, look out, Saskatonians! Yeah, well, we just we have a good base <laughs> right now, yeah, to yeah. kind of spread some, maybe some viral video stuff. I don't know. We'll see what we can so, come up so with. So essentially, yeah. the Ed and Ethan weekly podcast is going to come to an end, or the Ed and Ethan show weekly right. show. I would still like to, if we can, I still like to do like at least one a month podcast a month. Yeah, we'll see. You know, come in and, and chat, but you know, we'll, we'll got see these how it sweet goes. Mics, you can't do nothing. Yeah, with you know them. that's the thing, right? This uh, <laughs> this uh, these mics are set up. Yeah, and we we can't just let it rot. Either. So let's get to the show today. No guest today, by the way. We're phoning it in yeah. on this one. We're yeah. gonna <laughs> we're gonna do a bit of a shorter show, and we're gonna do just news and reviews and our bloviating. 
Uh, so we'll, we'll keep it to that. Uh, a Canadian court forces Google to remove search results worldwide as fears of memory hole grow. Whoa. Uh, this is, you know, you see this That's every creepy. so often with laws that are passed in one jurisdiction. We're looking at this with uh, New York's uh, bit license for yeah, Bitcoin, that's right. Right? That's right? Creating rules that will have global implications as companies try to uh, make sure that they'll be okay to do business in New York and around the world. Same kind of thing here, right? You have these uh, in the European courts, you've got this right to be forgotten, um, sort of this this legal right to have yourself removed from the internet uh, internet search results. Um, so that's creating ripples and waves. And now this Canadian court ruling uh, is forcing Google to remove search listings, not just for Google.ca, but beyond the country's borders too. The case could lead to more regional censorship practices becoming global. So. And this is kind of creepy, right? It's basically uh, this idea that Google, let's say you have a, a search engine result that you think is not very flattering when your name comes up. You can basically say, look, mm. I want that removed. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody mm -hmm. should be able to find that. I just want it gone, um, which I guess might be okay to request. But making this compulsory now opens up this process to, re to abuse, I think. Yeah, and we did have, like you said, the the different jurisdictions. We, they would just be, you know, that jurisdiction. Yeah. But this is is not just Google Google dot ca, but Google dot com, and I imagine other the other sure. sites, all anything Google. Of course, uh, I, I wish Google would put in like a little uh, thing at the bottom of their search that says like you want uncensored version, go to startpage dot com or something, <laughs> or DuckDuckGo or, or something, yeah, that right? New, that other service. I, I DuckDuckGo is kind of neat. It's uh, it's kind of like it. It mimics Google, but it focuses on anonymity. Because okay, that's what Startpage does too. I think it, is that. Yeah. See, I'm not even familiar with Startpage. I've, I've used it a little bit. I've used yeah. it a little bit just because like I've I've searched things on Google and I'm just like, what? I know this exists. Why isn't it coming up? <laughs> then I go to Startpage and yep, sure enough, yeah. there it is. Well, Google does give you these little messages at the bottom of the results right which Saying, is nice you know this yeah. is some some results have been removed mm -hmm. which which is just i don't know it's creepy right it's creepy because it's all forced yeah all of it is forced it That's doesn't right. there's no voluntary association here but yeah this is this is weird uh from the story that we're referencing the ruling already appears to be rippling beyond canada's borders for instance uh, when I searched, and the, the author speaking, when I searched in the U.S. for a product called GW-1000, Google shows that it has censored at least four web pages. Uh, the We Have Removed Results noticed almost surely relates to the Canadian court order, though Google did not immediately confirm this. Um, the Guardian warned that about six of its stories have gone, quote, down the memory hole. Huh. Uh, basically people not pleased with the stories about them or including details about them, um, demanding that they be removed, this wide sweeping sort of, you know, I, this is odd. <laughs> it's, it's weird. Where does anybody get that right to say you have information about you, you can't say it? Yeah, well, the, the businesses themselves can vo voluntarily choose uh, what... Um, they want to censor from themselves, but that is their choice. And if they d are doing it, public opinion essentially would be, hey, that's not cool. But right. in this situation, public opinion is, uh, I, I would assume most people don't want things censored other than the people that are yeah, want the things themselves censored. Well, even, so they go to the government. Even in the case of voluntary association, I don't even know if it would always be, hey, that's not cool. I mean, it depends on what type of information is being put out there. Well, yeah, I guess like uh, child porn stuff could be censored. I think that's legitimate. Sure. In a way. Well, in that case, I'm just trying to think of where people maybe have skeletons in their closet that get uh, revealed, right? And, and people don't want that. People don't want to be, you know, exposed to the light of honesty. It's too tough to deal with, right? And, that, and that's, that's why you use Snapchat, Ethan? <laughs> I, don't, I don't use Snapchat. I don't want to break anybody's phone. Um no, but I mean, there's there's this odd sort of, I, I guess people get this consequentialist uh, logic for where you get rights. So this right to be forgotten is basically, yeah. I don't want people saying this thing about me, so I'll just use the law to force them to stop. Look, here's, it's just a kind of a cold, hard reality of life. If you do something, let's say, that is bad and people find out about it, 
they have found out about it. You kind of have to. You have to kind of face up to that. Yeah. Which is, it's it, being honest with your social credit rating, essentially. Ah, yeah. Right. And this is kind of like scrubbing that social credit rating. This is this is getting rid of anybody's ability to judge you specifically on the information that's publicly available. And and, and look, I'm I'm not here saying that everybody should be, you know, hauled in front of the public spotlight. You know, everybody's little darkest, deepest secret mm-hmm. should be uh, scrutinized, whatever. What I am I'm saying mm-hmm. is that you should be accountable to the public. If there's information out there uh, about you, then oh well, you you kind of have to face up to it. There, there's to 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 use the government ban hammer to get rid of it. <laughs> you know, that's just kind of a. It doesn't really get rid of it either. That's right? true. It just makes it uh, harder for mm-hmm. you to find it because again, like I said, start page and what was it duck duck. Duck, duck, go. Duck, duck, go, yeah. How, how so. on earth can you possibly forget that? <laughs> duck, duck, go. That's I don't know. I thought so it was memorable. like duck, duck, goose. I was, that's what <laughs> that's I was, kind that's of the why idea. I was like, yeah, I yeah. know. Uh, so here, okay. So. Wait, wait, just wait. So I, so what, uh, like, th- we're talking about positive rights mm-hmm. and negative rights. Yeah, yeah. So do you want to differentiate between what are the, what's the difference? So a, a negative right is basically any right that you have for yourself like it's it, it's how you can administer your own life right you, you have you have that right because you are a human being right and yeah. a positive right is this idea that you can it's a right that you can impose some condition on somebody else yeah? and what give me an example so a positive right would be uh i as a woman can get my hair cut at a barber who doesn't want to cut my hair because ah. i have a right to have my hair mm-hmm. cut by whoever i like mm-hmm. that is a positive <laughs> right and you know what? It sounds hilariously comical. That was a case in Toronto, <laughs> Ontario, was. right? Was it that Toronto? Was a, or Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah okay. it was a Human Rights Commission case, uh, a barber shop who only cuts men's hair. Uh, and yeah. they're, they're Muslims and they're religious. And it was a religious, I think it was a religious thing. Was it? It might. I oh, yeah, it was. was I yeah. think it was. I think it was. Oh, she, that, she went there that, just wait, because, right? But there was an example, in fact, of two sorts of positive rights. Uh, like, so these right, religious right. rights where, oh, but we have the right to discriminate <laughs> because of our religion. Yeah. Right? So then, but you get this Canadian legal quagmire where, oh, but nobody has the right to discriminate. But wait a minute, these religious people, maybe they do. I don't, I don't, poof, heads yeah. explode, right? <laughs> so, but it's hilarious. All of these rights start clashing with each other because they are all positive rights, right? How can we impose our preferences upon other people? So in this case, in the case of Google and the right to be forgotten, right, where people are imposing their right to be forgotten on Google and other search engines, I think this just creates an incentive for decentralized search indexing services that have the functionality of Google. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're not going to see it tomorrow, but eventually it'll get there, right? It's going to be something like Ethereum. Uh, (laughs) Everything (laughs) comes back to Ethereum, hey? Ethereum, (laughs) where all of your dreams come true. No, I mean, (laughs) actually, we, um, I know somebody asked us on Twitter to do a show on open transactions. I don't know if we'll get to it before we wind down and and, uh, kick off here, but maybe we'll do a YouTube video about it or something. Yeah. Open transactions is pretty yeah. cool. Um, anyway, uh, in the end, all of this eventually, even though there's a legal right to be forgotten now, it's not going to last. You can't keep that going forever. There is now a market incentive. Look, here's the thing. The worst part about this for people who do want to be forgotten, yeah. quote unquote, they are creating exceptional scarcity of ah, interesting information. There you go. What is it? The Barber Streisand effect? Is that oh, there called? is the Streisand effect. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Basically, why are you suppressing this? Well, it must be interesting. I'll like to take a look at that. Yeah. Yeah. So, Human yeah. curiosity, man. You can't suppress that. Absolutely. You can't suppress it. It's Freedom all about market wins. incentives. So that brings us to an interesting Reddit post that you tracked down, Ed. This is pretty neat. A question posed. Why does Romania have the most highest speed connection? What are the reasons? And believe it or not, that was not me misspeaking. <laughs> so I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna try and I'm gonna try and uh, yeah. autocorrect as I read through this <laughs> response by Holy Gigi, 611 points upvoted, some Reddit gold granted Ooh. for this reply. Serious short answer: piracy. We started out like any other country with dial-up lines and 14.4, or if you were lucky, 56k modems. The state company that owns the landlines, Romtelcom. 
<laughs> had crazy expensive internet during the day, but after 10 p.m., it was 10 times cheaper. This period lasted huh. about two years, and a few people got to experience what internet actually meant. The first real networks we did have uh, not have access to the internet were basically big lands within an apartment complex. This way, most of the people could play Diablo 2, II, Quake 2, II, or StarCraft via LAN, even if the game was pirated. Direct connection via IP worked. People realized that being on a network was cool. You could download a song on dial-up, took about one hour with a 14-4 dial-up connection, share it instantly. <laughs> and share I remember it. those days. Indeed. <laughs> and share it instantly with your neighbor. He would download another song, and you could get that one from him. The flats started to link up with each other and created neighborhood networks. Still no internet. We are now in about two, year two of dial-up being available in Romania. ADSL made an appearance, but it was too expensive for most people, so it all but vanished in less than a year. These networks had to be maintained by someone, keep the switch plugged in, repair the cable that someone from the sixth floor cut because it looked bad hanging near his window, link the network with others, etc., etc. So the local sysadmin job was created. Since they were getting regular small payments, they decided to bring the real internet and make more money. You could pay X for LAN or X plus Y for LAN and internet. Since the target customer was the kid on the next floor, the prices had to be reasonable. More and more people started to get secondhand computers and needed software, Windows, Office, so they would pirate it. Yeah, it's not nice, but back it, who cares about pirating? Yeah. But back then, a license for Windows 95 was the equivalent of about two months' salary for a teacher or that of a policeman. So no one, and I mean it, no one, cared that the software was pirated. People loved the internet because you could download movies and watch them at home. You had software like DC++ that allowed you to download with 10 megabits per second from others within your network. And when I say download, you can read pirate. I honestly think that there's not one person in Romania who used a computer at least once and never downloaded anything illegal. By this time, there was at least one of these networks for every 50 to 100 people. The network started to link with each other via optical cable and would promote their speed with slogans like 100 megabits per second within the city, one megabit outside, or download a movie in minutes. Just mm. in my neighborhood, we had about five of these firms. Cool. Then the torrents got popular and the S hit the fan. <laughs> People switched from DC++ to torrents within months and the networks had to keep up. So they added more capacity and advertised better upload speeds. And by this time, most of the cities were connected via fiber. So you could download almost anything with huh. around 10 megabits per second. All in all... The switch from 56K to 100 megabits per second took less than two years in big wow. cities. Extreme levels of piracy, literally, you didn't know anyone who had a license for anything back then, meant that the police did not care. They were pirating stuff as well. <laughs> the too long, didn't read version. Romanians love movies. We needed a way to download them, and fiber was the answer. Much cheaper than copper. No risk of the cables getting stolen. So this kind of destroys, uh, we need government to run cables uh, everywhere too. I just kind of yeah. You know what I mean? No, th it is right. You know, th actually, he goes on to explain. It's all this. anarchy here, man. It's he all goes anarchy. on to explain this in in an edited portion of the post. He's, I'm just explaining how things got started here, and honestly, the company's never lost a penny because we got to download stuff for free. No one could afford to legally buy the content. Oh, there was right never there. Yeah, there That's was never beautiful. a choice between buying and pirating it. This is something most people in the West don't get. We were never like, hey, I can buy this new game, but uh, uh, screw it, I'll just pirate it and keep the money. Back then, most of us did not have the money in the first place. In 2003, the median income for the entire year was $2,700, so less than two fifty dollars a month. If you think that uh, people with that income had the option of spending $50 to buy a game or $15 to buy a DVD, you're dead wrong. People had more pressing matters that needed money like food and bills. Even now... The lowest income salary is around $250. Do you honestly think people who make so little are able to spend $150 for Windows? Buying the software is simply not an option for them. Also, and this is where he gets to the expansion point, also, to the people saying that this wouldn't work in the U.S. due to the huge size difference, who says you have to blanket the entire nation with fiber on day one? I agree, that's impossible. You start with areas that might have a, a high population density and then fan out to lower and lower population density zones. Yeah. And that's actually that's what typically what, yeah, yeah. That's what Google's doing. Uh, we see right now there's a... a a uh, project in Toronto, Ontario, where they're trying to uh, install high-speed wireless internet for uh, people in high uh, high density residential areas, mm. right? Mm. Um, and that's all you know. You, again, you start where the most service can be delivered, mm -hmm. the most profit can be made, mm -hmm. and yeah, you you fan out from there. That is how it works. 
I, I just have to point out that you know he says you know piracy not good. Well, you know what? <laughs> Copying is not. You're not taking anything from anybody when you copy something. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's just yeah. really basic. <laughs> really, yeah. really basic. It's there. funny. There's an anti uh, piracy uh, sort of advertisement that pops up on my Facebook feed. I saw often. that too. Yeah. Yeah. And the comments are hilarious. It's just, it all, just I, I commented on there. I was I yeah. put copying is not theft. Simple. And, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I probably to... probably flagged because of that now too. But you know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't flagged before, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. It, it it is hilarious though because you get these. You know, you, it, you you get a post saying, okay, so you know, this is the Canadian Anti Piracy Coalition or whatever, yeah, yeah. and and then yeah, you just see a hundred comments and and ninety five percent they're just. Copying is fine. Piracy is not a, a crime. Mm-hmm. You know, entering a new age, right? Yeah, yeah. People it's understand. Cool. It's it's pretty basic too. And you know that that that's, he points out something really great there too. People that pirate aren't going to buy it, so they're not yeah. losing revenue because they're not going to buy it anyway. Well, this, this right? comes to all sorts of quote unquote pirated goods, and we'll save the other stories for after the break here. But yeah, this is yeah. this is all all of, all of these pirated goods, right? You get, uh, for instance, knockoff Tommy Hilfiger shirts, right? They're mm-hmm. not going to be sold to the people who are buying genuine exactly. Tommy Hilfiger. Exactly. Typically, they know, right? Well, you know, you'd think that you'd know, right? I remember my buddy's like, "Oh, I got these really good Oakleys in Mexico." I'm like, "Dude." <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. You know that they're not real. Yeah, yeah. They look real. Yeah. They, 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 they did a really good job of knockoffs, but sure. what does it matter? Well, not you only that, I mean? but I mean, who wants to knock off an unsuccessful, unpopular product anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Yeah. You, you're talking That's about, right. oh, how you know, uh, piracy and knockoffs are so harmful. Well, well, hold on. You know, these things are already successful and ubiquitous in the mm-hmm. world. That's one of the reasons people want them. And, and, and then and you yeah. have uh, Netflix, which great research and development from Netflix. Yeah. Uh, they want to put stuff on Netflix. They went to the piracy websites to see what was popular. <laughs> and then what what do you have? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I look on my computer from, like, say, my anime collection. Yeah. It, Netflix is so close to that same collection. <laughs> and and I went, all I did was went and got the most popular anime. Yeah. So what's most popular anime is translates to what Netflix puts on their service. It's beautiful. It is beautiful and it's 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 all part of that realization of a market that develops, right? So not only now do you have like take take a uh, take Game of Thrones for example, yeah. right? George yeah. R. R. Martin talks about how piracy is great for Game of Thrones. It, you know, it spreads the brand around and it's because they don't just make money by recording and producing these episodes, guess what? They have all sorts of merchandising and all sorts of other stuff that goes into the marketing of the brand and that creates a bunch of profit. Mm-hmm. So it's it's also about <laughs> driving this more creative model for monetizing projects, Yes, right? exactly. It's instead of, um, well, you have, it's kind of like the market is changing where people get the product and then they are willing to, what they are willing to give the producer of that product. Mm-hmm. It's that, that whole thing is, or the whole, like, of course, you know, physical products are always going to have to pay for something up front in a sure. sense. But with, when it comes to digital, I think that's the new future or subscription based. I just too, like, like the Netflix. idea of all of this being an incentive for being more creative. Exactly. The alternative is, oh, everybody should have scarce information by default. Our songs mm-hmm. should be scarce because that's mm-hmm. how we can make money. Well, hold on. You're, you're, you're denying yourself that incentive, that, uh, that, that motivator to be more creative and appeal to the market in more Times different ways. Times are changing. Times are changing, including the time for this segment. It's time for the next. We'll be back right after the music, the break, all that good stuff right here on DailyPaulRadio.com. <laughs> you are listening to Ed and Ethan. We know you're tired of all the useless background chatter from the mainstream media. It's no wonder they struggle as much as they do, despite all the resources they're given. But that's why we're here. Be sure to visit us at edandethan.com to check out our newest updates. And while you're there, hit the donate button to help us further develop our product for your benefit. If you're a Bitcoin fan, look for our Bitcoin wallet address on the edandethan.com homepage and throw us some Satoshis. Of course, you could always just stick with the status quo. It's just great because it's got all the answers. Zombie what brains? Now from Global Edmonton, the news hour with Gordon. Brains. This is CNN. Brains. 
This is CTV News. <laughs> Brains. CBC News. <laughs> and Brains. <laughs> The Ed and Ethan Podcast. Come to where the brains are. The government, the one that makes sure my air is clean and that my food has only an acceptable amount of rat feces An acceptable in it. amount of rat feces. <laughs> that's important. And you yes. know what? That's why we need government around. We need the nanny state, Ethan. Indeed. Welcome you're not back. smart enough. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back from the break. Uh, I didn't mention in the first half of the show, but we do want to talk about these crazy, awesome stories, hilariously awful uh, stories <sighs> about farms uh, and regulation, government regulation. So that Dale Gribble clip foot mm. fit really well. I'm sorry, I'm suffering from foot in mouth disease. Um, okay, so there's up here in Kanakistan, we had this great story of the government keeping children safe. Yeah, you know. right from our, our home province here in Saskatchewan. Yeah, in Saskatchewan or <laughs> Saskabush, whichever. I don't I can't remember where we live. Uh so anyway, there's the okay. Obviously here in central Canada where the Great Plains extend yes. for miles and miles, you can see both ends of every train. <laughs> it's true. Uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. It is true. Yeah. So we we obviously have a very traditionalized farming culture, right? So yeah. lots of family farms. There are big corporate farms now too. Lots of those, but yeah. still lots of family farms exist. And on the family farm, kids often work a lot of chores that you would expect them to work. So they participate yeah. in the farm. Usually, right? uh, farm families have bigger families too because of that. It's more labor capital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Many so, hands make light work, right? That's, uh, yeah, good point. So uh, there was a story that came up here, and public pressure has, in fact, changed uh, the outcome right now, although it's <laughs> still silly. Hilarious. But okay, so the original story is basically that uh, a cranky neighbor uh, <laughs> complains to Occupational Health and Safety Services that this family has children working on their farm. Oh no. Ah, dun dun dun. And in Saskatchewan, if you are 15 years of age or under, you cannot be employed in a licensed food production facility. And the the the, the right. issue here yeah. is that these children were working uh, in the packaging plant, so processing chicken, uh, you know, putting them in vacuum sealed bags and such. And I think they were 8 and 10 years old. Yes. That's right. Pretty, so, pretty young, you know. Pretty uh, young, that's right. And on top of these They, they should be heinous, out being children, Ethan. Why are they working? <laughs> What's going on here? On top of these heinous crimes, allowing their children to work in this licensed meat processing facility on the farm, beyond that, they're also employing some local teenagers, uh, yeah. 15 and under, yeah. right? Uh, paying them for a few hours a week to help package uh, I think, up chicken. I think one was, was 15 and the rest were over 16. Because it, it, oh, it was a okay. 16, I think, what it was. Yeah, 16 they, they and okay. up, you're allowed. Yeah. Yeah. Allowed. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So anyway, when this story first breaks, obviously people just become outraged. Just like, what the heck? Come on. It's a farm. Yeah. Of course kids work on the farm. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. How long has that been going on? <laughs> Maybe since forever? So Just common sense, right? That's, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so I was actually, I was listening to, I haven't done this in years. I was listening to a local talk radio show, listening to the callers. And of course, of course, there are plenty of- I feel bad of, for you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I listened to plenty of righteous indignation on the part of people who are, you know, these Kids are being taught good work ethic and all that stuff. And gosh, why isn't common sense being applied? This is silly and inane and stupid. Um, and one call was oh. was from a former OHS inspector, mm. and she told this really creepy, odd story. I mean, for her it was normal. For the host, it was normal. But for me, listening to it, I was just getting my shivers. <laughs> um, but she was talking about, okay, so she was an OHS worker, an inspector, and they got a complaint. Uh, it's basically uh, a woman's, I think it was her daughter, applied to work somewhere, and they said, no, we can't apply. We can't employ you because you're, uh, you're 15 or under, right? Um, and they had in this restaurant, I think it was, a fast food restaurant, they had people who were there working 15 and under. Uh, so the mother 
then became vindictive and said, "Oh, you're not, well. I'll, if you don't hire my daughter, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to phone the government and punish uh, you." Yeah. Right? So that's exactly what she did. She launched a complaint. Um, I don't court, get what I want, so I'm going to go to the local mafia <laughs> to get what I want. Not or even just to get smear what it, you, I guess. Yeah, just destroy it's just your business. Just yeah. revenge. That's what it was. Uh, and so the inspector goes. She finds it. Yeah, okay. There's some underage people here working. And so she says in this story. And what I had to do, and I was just doing my job, <clears throat> just following orders. <laughs> right? So what I had to do, I was just doing my job. I had to look through, and I had to issue some fines and tell them that they had to terminate the employees. You know, that's what I do. That's my job. And then she goes on to talk about how she wrote to her director a letter saying that this was wrong and they shouldn't be doing this, and she just felt really bad about it. Huh. So look, here's yeah. the problem, I, and I know I'm, I'm hesitant to call that cowardice because look, she's doing her job and she's she'll get fired if she doesn't. Right. Blah blah blah. There's, so she's got yeah, she's incentivized. Yeah, yeah. But it is cowardice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, you may you to this point where uh, you could do something different. You are certainly uncomfortable. You know it's wrong. You yeah. do it anyway, though, because yep. that's your job. Just following orders. She's she's essentially it's kind of funny because she's essentially getting it make it so someone doesn't work so she can work when it, if, if it was worked the other way around <laughs> was if she she complained before she went across and and attacked them through the government maybe she wouldn't have a job and the other people probably wouldn't have a job anyway because someone else would just <laughs> fill that spot but yeah she could feel better with her conscience maybe. so this story in Saskatchewan does progress. So these, obviously, all this yeah. righteous indignation and public pressure. So Labor Minister Don Morgan here in Sask- Saskatchewan, he says, okay, it's just common sense. These kids are going to be allowed to work in the licensed meat processing facility because, you know, they're they're part of the family. However, mm. the family cannot hire other local teens under 16 years of age. So wait. So family <sighs> is the determiner, I guess. Somehow. Yeah. Talk about common hmm. sense. Wait a minute. <laughs> in one breath, it's common sense, and then in the other breath, arbitrary, arbitrary rule. Because, family. Well, you, family it, okay? Not family, not okay. It's probably because the the, the parents are the owners, and then uh, they have uh, direct supervision, and then they are directly responsible for the consequences of the children that make those problems. Because because children are, are parents own their children, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. You can have your property processing meat. <laughs> Maybe that's it. I don't know. It just seems really weird. So if these youngsters that are part of the family, if they can participate in the meat processing facility, why cannot other youngsters who are paid and they train them, why can they not participate? If the Biology. That's right. It's yeah. you know, that's arbitrary, right? Obviously. It is. It's completely it is. arbitrary. So there it's good that these children now, you know They get an exception. They but that's what it is. And mm-hmm. it's an exception. And, and the Which, other thing uh, too is uh, is Don Morgan uh or somebody from government, I think it was Don Morgan, he basically says, you know, this is common sense and the reason that we're <laughs> we're not we're just making the exception and we're not extending this to other local teens. The law is the law. Oh, man. Which is a complete contradiction. It's weird. And then one breath, it's common sense. And then the other breath, the law is the law. What? And this coming, by the way, from a lawmaker. (laughs) (laughs) So it's even more ridiculous to say such a thing. Yes, it is. Right? What's interesting, though, too, is is how, how short a time it took. Too right, <laughs> yeah. For this a, whole a process, days, a few yeah. days. So like, it, like it normally, speedy justice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Normally, you know, if there's no public outrage, I wonder if it took would take months for this complaint to be followed up. I wonder if it would take months for the paperwork to be followed, mm. to be filed, and then the process for them to actually not be there or this exemption to happen. But you know, we lo- there was a it was a poll, and it was like close to twenty thousand people said, you know, this is more than there's about twenty three thousand people voted in that yeah. CBC poll. So that like you know Saskatchewan, that's that's pretty that's a pretty large amount. Uh, maybe it wasn't. It's was probably like a national oh, story yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But you know, that's interesting in itself, and just kind of doesn't make any sense because you know government uh, but uh, these laws are important aren't they they keep people safe like i said it was government keeping people safe that's what the story is about yeah right 
um, nanny state for the win, I guess. <laughs> okay, look, state, agriculture is a dangerous industry, right? Oh, I, yes, we're you know, yes, that's right. It, that's, that, it is dangerous. A lot of people get injured. There are a number of fatalities in the agricultural industry. It's rough out there. So shouldn't children be shielded, protected from that? So mm-hmm. we should force uh, <laughs> parents to f- force, meaning like point guns at them right. indirectly through the through the legislation process. Uh, to make it so they, they children can't work. Hmm. Uh, okay, here's the thing. Obviously, here, here's the argument, right? That's so kind of screwed so up. So children, now, the human brain is like a risk-calculating machine, yes. right? And the argument is that hu- human children are not, they don't have the best risk-value judgment yet. You know, they haven't been given time to develop it properly. That might be true. That it, might be true. I think so. I think, I think it's probably reasonable to assume that an eight-year-old probably won't be able to evaluate risk value judgments mm-hmm. as well as a 28-year-old, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Life experience, right, right, right. right there. Plus, their brains aren't fully developed, I would agree. Sure. So that's, that's why argument. parents are there, I guess, too, ah, right? Yeah. There you go. Guides so that's why parents world. are there. But the idea is that maybe parents also don't really know. Or, or maybe even other workers, Right. right. It doesn't have to be the parents. It doesn't have so, to be the supervisor. Government should probably step in with its all knowing wisdom to tell huh. you what risks are okay and what risks are not. So so these people that work in these government bureaucracies, they, they've worked in the in the chicken uh poultry industry, right? No it, but they've read books. Oh. Oh, uh, well, that that makes it all the better. (laughs) Similarly, if somebody who had read a book about driving a truck were to tell me how to drive a truck, I would trust everything they said implicitly. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. (laughs) Wait, there might be a problem with that. See, here's the... Government is is full of people, too, right? That's right. So, okay, we're we're kind of hopping, dancing around the issue. Obviously, so here's, here's the thing, right? So, obviously, parents have an incentive to keep their children safe. Even the most heartless, cold, and... Uh, evil parent who well, just sees they're the making child money as, off of these kids, right? Yeah, I was too. just gonna say if they just see them as a labor capital device, yeah, yeah. and they don't. I mean, come on, yeah. I know. Uh, but even in that case, they still have an incentive to keep the labor capital generating revenue generating machine alive, right? Yeah, yeah. So parents are obviously part of educating their children about risk value judgment. This is why you see kids in industrial service applications uh, being told by parents. Stay over here, play with the dogs while I unload the cattle because you can just watch and learn right now. Yeah. You know, I'm making the judgment that you're better served by just watching. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Mm -hmm. and sure, sometimes children and adults alike get injured. Sometimes horrible things happen. It's true. Agriculture is unsafe. It is more dangerous. And in exchange, living through all of these risks and making those risk value judgments better equips you in the future for making better judgments. It's yes. just that's part of it, right? It's, oh it's like goodness. building a skill set. Exactly. Now, it's gaining experience. Now, the... Uh, the the opposite idea that maybe you should just be shielded from all of this and and yeah. so what do you do? You spend uh, sixteen years of your life basically just not knowing about it or mm-hmm. getting a very limited view of of what you can mm. understand. I would argue at that point, then when you turn sixteen, you are much less better equipped to deal with risk management than the ten year old is who's been slicing and packaging chicken for you know uh, ten years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or I guess not when they were an infant, but I don't know, like five years. Yeah. Well, yeah. It the, the child labor laws are really hurting uh, the children's uh, ability to gain experience in the work totally. world. In the work world, and you know, it's even crazier is you know you go through public education for twelve years, <laughs> and then you go to university for four years. Yeah. Oh, well, you get out, you're like, what, 24, 23 years old, and you've never had, like, a job? Oh, like, you I've know, that, run that's into possible. Those pe- no, I've run into those people a lot. Yeah, so then they, yeah. they think that they're entitled to jobs now that they have this college <sighs> degree. You know, I, I've talked to employers, and uh, lots of people, they would rather, um, this is totally anecdotal, too, you know, I don't have any yeah. proof, but people, when you have lots of experience and different, different experiences and different jobs, those people would get hired over people who have a college education. Right. Because college education, you write papers and uh, whatnot. So like that is yeah. not really getting you experience for the world, the real world. Sure. So hey, yeah. Theory and practical application are different, yes. right? Um, you know, the- a, me- a mentor system, I think, is great, too. Like um, I think so. 
and, and uh, it's like 10 years old, I think people, I think they should be able to choose that. You know, maybe the parents make that ultimate decision. Do you I don't, think, I wouldn't be that one of those parents. Do but, you think it's possible for a brain surgeon to be mentored? I, uh, yeah, I think so. No, really? Uh, <laughs> I, I think that machines could probably even do brain surgery even better. But, well, okay, that's know, a different that. topic. But <laughs> no, I'm, th- I think even the most complex tasks, the most intriguing sort of complex tasks, can be all based on mentorship. I think that can absolutely happen. Yeah. I yeah. don't think that, like, all of the, basically universities and colleges are the uh, industrialization of mentorship, which is fine. That's okay. Uh, but I don't think that basically making it the uniform, universal standard is beneficial. Mm-hmm. That doesn't that doesn't serve people well. I think self taught is is your you you if you self teach yourself something that is a huge resource because you know how to teach yourself something. True, right? That that's a better resource than going to a, a big school or a big university and then someone just feeding you the knowledge and then you just regurgitating it back to them. Yeah, uh, I don't know. It just doesn't. Here's um. Sorry, somewhat unrelated thought, but I do I do want to cram it into the show today because I thought this was cool. Okay. Uh, somebody was somebody was asking me on Facebook a few questions to try to determine where my inconsistencies might be, and we were talking about employers mm. and employees, mm-hmm, right? Because mm-hmm. there was a I think it was some I, I should have put it in the lineup. It was uh, it was some story about a restaurant that gave discounts for people who prayed in public. Who, who publicly prayed, right? They give a 15% discount how on the they, bill. How would they determine that? Yeah, just basically if you noted it. Like if you, oh, hey, look, they're publicly praying unashamed. Good, wonderful Christians. Let's give them a discount, okay, right? Sure. So that's basically that's the cool. restaurant. So the restaurant was forced to, to stop doing this or whatever. Anyway, so. Because of discrimination? I think that's what, I can't yeah. remember the story. I, like I said, I didn't put it in the lineup, so I didn't read it. But there is, uh, we got into a discussion because, you know, is this discrimination, praying in public, being incentivized to do that? What, what if it was a story of somebody, some restaurant that gave uh, a 15% uh, increase in the bill for people who prayed? Uh, okay, fine, oh, <laughs> whatever. <Yeah. laughs> you don't have to go there, right? That's you right. Don't have to See, buy their food. Works for me. I'm fine, I'm fine with that. But anyway, so... Uh, in, in this discussion, this person was asking me some things like, well, okay, what about different types of discrimination? I mean, should employers be allowed to discriminate for, say, hiring? And a thought came to mind. As it, well, first off, absolutely, yeah. Of course they should they be able to They do it all the time anyway, right? Shh. Oh, oh. You have to play the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do do it all the time How How would they not? Right? How do you determine yeah. what who's a good worker or not? You got to discriminate for something, right? I remember well, I remember a landlord in Toronto, Ontario when I lived there saying he was telling me about how he told a prospective tenant quite outright and blatantly, "I don't want to rent to you cuz you're kind of dirty looking. I mean, unfortunately, I just don't think you'd fit in here." Mm-hmm. Uh mm-hmm. So the guy took him to the rentalsman or something. Oh, uh, yeah. And he got in a lot of trouble. He had he got fined. So he said basically think from it, then don't on. Don't say it. <laughs> that's no, that's exactly it. He said yeah. from then on, I'll still discriminate <laughs> against those tenants. I just yeah. don't tell them. Yeah. Which seems to me like counterproductive. So now maybe some people don't know why they are being exactly. rejected. Exactly. Like how how do you know if mm. you're whatever, yeah. if there's a problem, if no one tells you there's a problem? How yeah. do you fix that problem? But anyway, Anyway, look, so here's what the thought that came to mind in respect to employers is, okay, so employers, people generally think employers should not be allowed to discriminate against employees, but it occurs to me, employees are fully afforded such a right. (laughs) In fact, if I were to say myself, I don't like working for gay people. Those homosexuals make me so uncomfortable. And I can even say this outright loudly in my boss's office, let's say, yeah, yeah. who I don't believe is a homosexual, but who knows. Um, I could say that in the office, totally okay. It's, you know, I mean, it might be a bit of a dick move, but it would be totally yeah. okay legally. No repercussions. However, if my employer were to say that Ethan is a little bit too flaming for me, he makes me uncomfortable and that's why I'm firing him. Oh my gosh, would you ever believe the storm that would find that person's office? Wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it seems like a bit of a double standard, right? I guess the idea is employers, well, they discriminate and they're, they're they taking the power. Adva- they're, they're exploiting yeah. their employees, right? I mean, my gosh, an employee gets paid $10 an hour, but the employer is, is making uh, $12 an hour off of that employee. Well, hold on. They're paying the employee. T- they're actually only making two, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In fact, 
typically wages are the largest expense of any company out there, typically. It's not always the case, but Mm -hmm. typically that is the case. Isn't it the employees who are are exploiting their employer? For an hour of labor that produces so much value, if the employee takes the lion's share of that produced value, who's exploiting who? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'll agree. Who's got the major risk in starting up their business? That's right. The business the business owner, man. There, and there's so much uh, paperwork and stuff you need to taxes and all this other sure. stuff. And uh, I I think that I think it kind of stems from the labor union movement where you, you are you are a wage slave. You are you are a human capital that is manipulated by the capitalists, the evil capitalists. <laughs> so we need to have all these special laws against or for the worker, because the the capitalist holds the power, holds the keys, even though uh, the relationship is more symbiotic than people want to believe. I think so. Yeah, it, it's 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 a weird sort of perception. I think it's people being typically unable to to interpret value. Yeah, right. They don't see labor hours as units of value, but they are. Mm-hmm. Labor hours are just mm-hmm. like dollars and cents. They're they are expressions of value. It's that simple. So, like, you as an employee, you're selling your labor hours. You are giving them to the employer. And in exchange, the employer is giving you dollars. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's how it works. It is an exchange. So, to, to I don't know, just, just give employees these superior rights because they're viewed as the meek, you know, the unpowerful. The only reason that they are, in fact, they kind of are. The only reason that that's the case is because... Uh, corporatists are able to go uh, to government to force employees' hands. Yes, mm-hmm. that's what makes it. That's what makes this controversial oppositional relationship even more oppositional. In fact, oppositional at all. Never, never mind even more. It's just oppositional at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What I, I, what I'd honestly like to see is just everyone to be an entrepreneur. You know, wouldn't that be yeah, great? Kind of cool. I, well, I mean, like organic it's, farmers. Hey, hey, it's possible with Ethereum. <laughs> <laughs> All of your dreams come true. No, uh, okay. you know, we, we rip on that. But honestly, Ethereum is pretty cool. I know it is. It is really great. Um, these, my my attempt at a segue, uh, these... We, we come off the back of this one story. I guess we kind of went all on yeah, labor. We, we kind of went a little yeah. weird with that but one, let's, But let's quickly mention before we uh, we end off the show here, there's another story uh, from the states here in Michigan. Uh, basically, the government raids this organic farm. They uh, break yeah. all of the eggs one by one, dump what out a, milk. And this happens ridiculous. all the time, right? Yeah. It's, you, it's you, a mafia, really, breaking, yeah. breaking your windows and, and f- with the bat in front of you saying, you know, you better watch out because you know we're right here. We're gonna we're gonna hurt you if you don't do what we tell you to do. What's Give us the production weird? money. You know all of these people making these voluntary choices about what they want yeah. to eat, what what kind of what kind of food they want to go after. Like I, personally, I'm not a big fan of organic food. It's more expensive. It's typically just not what I want. But you know, like this this people can make that choice, can't they? Unless they live in the free world, apparently. Yeah, well, then they're not free to. I, I think the <laughs> argument is that you're not smart enough to make choices when it comes to food yourself, and you need a giant regulator that knows better than you, that has the processes mm. in place to check the food. And if that food is not being checked, then there's a possibility that it might be dangerous, so we need to protect you from because yourself. Because everybody wants to sell rotten, horrible yeah, know, food hey? to people. It's a mm-hmm. big, big business, man. So many profits... <laughs> See, they're protecting the children because the children can't make those choices. I, I don't know. I just That's, they even have. But, oh. the, but the thing is, like, it, it's just such non. Like, it's not common sense. It's just no. not yeah. right. Mm-hmm. You, you have these people who are wanting to provide a, provide a service. Government comes along, breaks eggs, smashes bottles of milk and whatever. Like, it's just it's it's so heavy handed. And and what really is the positive outcome here? There's the, do you this remember production that? destruction? Right, they're destroying exactly. wealth. Hardcore here. So that could possibly increase the prices for everybody else too because of that. Sure, and we All saw this. We saw this in, in communist countries, like in uh, oh, I'm gonna say Ukraine. Yeah, uh, way back when they cut the uh, government. Well, no, 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 no. Let's take that's a genocidal thing. That's different yeah. in the 30s. We're talking about in the 30s in the United States where they went out and openly destroyed crops. They killed pigs, mass slaughtering pigs to mm. keep the prices high for the farmers. It's incredible. 
It's incredible. So you get this organic farm. You have all of these labor hours that have been allocated to producing goods. Usually more expensive because of that fact, because it's more intensive labor. Yeah. And they just destroy it. Wow. <laughs> Nuts, isn't it? It's I mean, crazy. Do you remember that story about all of that venison uh, deer meat That's that was right. donated by hunters oh, and then they just man. poured bleach on it? What? The government oh. just said, no, 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 oh, no, that you, makes can't, me you angry. Can't, can't just donate meat. We can't eat, you can't, homeless people can't eat meat. Uh, that was donated, yeah. no. Nah. We're going to destroy it. What an insane world. Absolutely crazy. Do you want to do a bit of an after show yeah let's today? do some we got we didn't get to too many stories here uh, four yeah <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a little bit i gotta go soon yes, but we'll, do. we'll do a bit so uh in the meantime though it it has been a great second to last show right yeah yeah you know yeah. no guess but i think we've had fun ranting oh it's always fun man <laughs> i will miss this that's why we gotta do it once too. a month that's right yeah well, well i don't know once we'll, try, a, we'll, we'll, we'll try. see we'll see what we can come up with but uh it has been a lot of fun i hope that uh you have enjoyed listening to this, our second to last show, and that you'll join us for our uh, next show, you know, our the, last the, show. The next show is entitled, it's 123. One, two, three. Oh. I don't know if that makes a... It's a sign, man. Yeah. The cosmos are aligning and smashing into my brain. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much for listening. Check us out at edneathan.com. Feedback at edneathan.com is how you get a hold of us uh, for a little while longer. This, my friends, is Ed Nathan.